Welcome to this month's reading of your poetry on the Haiku P podcast. It's episode 12 of the fourth series, and my name is Patricia. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by three fellow Brits, James Young, Ted Sherman, and Mark Gilbert. Regulars to the podcast will know their poetry, and of course, we've met Ted before when he came along to episode seven of the fourth series to talk about his pen and corrections project. And by the way, the book is now published with the profits going to charity. I'll put the details in the show notes. And we know Mark too, because he came along in series two, episode 17, to introduce us to Huku. If you haven't heard that episode, please do go along and have a listen. And then there's James. Now, James we know because he's very active in the podcast as one of our regular editors. And today, he's been persuaded to come to the mic. All three will be telling us which of today's poems they'd like to nominate for the judge's choice. Today's poems were a response to the Kigo prompt, which was introduced to us by Randy Brooks. There's a workshop by him on this topic in the PTV section of the website. Speaking of which, I've had a bit of a clean-up. I hope things are going to be so much easier for you to find on the website, and I've even put a search button too. Do try it out and tell me if you think it's better. And I have to say a thank you to Richard L. Matter, who not only bought me a lovely coffee this month, but also sent me a suggestion for improvements to the website, for which I'm really grateful. Thanks, Richard. Slowly but surely, I'm getting there. Submissions for Selective Realism are now closed, but you can start thinking about your haiku or senryu using Yugen for next month. Submissions will reopen on the 1st of July. Please, please listen to Stanford M. Forrester's workshop about Yugen, also on the website. He'll give you some great examples and tips to help you with your submission. And now on with the poetry. But before we hear your original work, let's hear a couple of poems that have been previously published. Poems first, poets second. Fallow fields, a light dusting of snow geese. Debbie Strange, Mariposa 39. Shortlisted for the 2018 Touchstone Awards. We wander in the rose garden, pollen on your nose. Alison Douglas Turner, from Haiku Universe. My thanks to Debbie and Alison for sending them in to the podcast. And now it's over to you for your original Haiku and Senryu. Let's start today's poetry with Ted Sherman's nomination for the judge's voice. Hi, Ted. How's it going with the publication of your haiku book from the Pen and Corrections Project? Hi, Patricia. Um, yeah, it's going well. The fundraising campaign has closed now, and everyone who has ordered a book should be receiving them in the post in the next couple of days, I think. Wonderful. And um, can people still buy books, or have you run out? No, we've got some left, so if, if they contact me via book at penandcorrections.com they can still order copies wonderful well what yep. i'll do then is i'll put the address in the show notes and people can come to you directly about that brilliant thank you now ted which of this month's haiku did you want to nominate i am nominating this haiku side by side shelling peas scent of fresh cut grass by Alison Douglas Tourner. I guess where to start really with this wonderful poem. This is a poem which contains everything that I love about haiku. Mystery, memory, subtlety, clear fragment and phrase and a sensitivity to sound. The opening line for me drops the reader right into, I guess, a kind of sea of questions. So what is side by side? Is it the poet or is it something else? 
the, uh, there's also the question of kind of where is this happening? Then as the reader moves on to the second line, a possible answer is given. So you get these people performing a shared task, shelling peas um, that are side by side. But we aren't given the details. We don't know who these people are, what their relationship is, or even how many there are. And this openness within these first two lines allows the reader to step into the poem and make it their own. They're allowed to use their memories, experiences or imagination to fill in the blanks. For me, this is two people, me and my mother, sat popping out peas into a, a Tupperware bowl um, with all the shells around our feet. So after reading that second line, you get an additional association um, added, certainly I do, uh, to the first line, and that is of all the peas being sat side by side in the pod. Um, I don't suppose this is what the poet intended, but it's a pleasing, subtle image for me. The last line of the poem provides a strong cut as the reader is taken from the visual scene of the peas being shelled to the smell of cut grass. This is a wonderful moment which shakes up the opening two lines and requires the reader to reconsider what's happening. Are the peas being shelled outside or is there an aroma coming from the peas that is similar to cut grass? For me, the smell is coming through an open window into the kitchen where my mother and I are preparing the peas. This last line creates a strong sense of the colour green within the poem. Suddenly, the re reader is drawn to noticing just how green the peas are by the mentioning of grass. The kigo is subtle within this poem, which I like. Um, I associate peas being ready to eat and the cutting of grass with summer, and this association brightens the colour I've already mentioned. The use of a repeated S and SH sounds in the poem creates unity uh, throughout it, but it also provides a softness to, to what is a gentle, relaxed scene. These sounds create a gentle flow through the poem, like a breeze on which the smell of cut grass is carried. After several readings, I began to see the poem as a little pea, something that was being uncovered by me, something I could roll around and explore and then pop into my mouth and enjoy the sweetness of it. Essentially, I love this poem. Side by side, shelling peas, scent of fresh cut grass by Alison Douglas Tourner. Thanks, Ted. How appropriate that you saw it as a little pea, given the podcast we're, we're doing today. Isn't it? I, yeah, it is. I loved it too. And I said, just like you, when I read the poem, I was transported back to my childhood. I was in the kitchen on doorstep, looking outside, shelling those peas and I don't know about you, Ted, when you were eating, when you were shelling the peas, did you get a real taste for raw peas? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Still love it. Yeah. Thanks, Ted. And Thank now you. we're going to hear some more original poetry. Dusk, the white yucca flowers highlighted by fireflies. Christine Wink Harrison Million suns, fields of mustard flowers in chill wind Near a cash up Bouquet of daisies, mere grocery store flowers to brighten a room Shana F. Brewer Wind chimes the Vibrant Colour of Tulips Laura Driscoll Laura, thanks very much for that example of synesthesia, or switching senses. I find that quite a hard technique to use. Vintage Violets Still Blooming School Reunion Dorothy Burrows Bindweed, anti-clockwise around the pond today. Tony Williams Pink blooms, an addict's eyes wander the redbud branch. M. Shane Pruitt 
Shane, I really enjoyed the way you changed the mood of the poem, and at least in my case, surprising me by the opening image of the beautiful blooms and then comparing them and contrasting them to the rather dark image of the addict's eyes. Pink boughs, tender grass, as swallows arrive. Mariangela Canzi Peak bloom, she swings a sandal from one toe. P. H. Fisher I hand her yellow daffodils. She recites Wordsworth. Dale Bennett Half hidden along this dusty road, a rhododendron blooms. Julie Gomez Bluebell wood, the beauty of the shadows, perched dragonfly. Catherine E. Winnick Last Pink Rose We Do Not Bring It Up Roberta Beach Jacobson Purple Highlights in the Neighbour's Fir Tree Wisteria Liam Maguire Petals in the Wind Hut on a Hillock with a Sagging Roof Fillmore Place Field of flowers, sweethearts love again on a blanket of blooms. Barbara Carlson Berry picking, survival jam spreads thin in winter. Wayne Kingston Wild strawberries, the sweetness of not picking them. Pat Davis Woodland Trail, the sweet taste of huckleberries. Kathleen Tice Eager seedlings, blackberry winter nips the buds. J. L. Huffman Cranberry season, scissors parting red silk. Pippa Phillips A woman hums under the slow, shady sway of plum blossoms. Brett Brady Cherry Blossom, All That Remains of the Fox's Wedding Hannah Hulbert Peach Blossom, Once My Dreams, Just As Pink Anna Maria Domberg, San Cristoforo Organic apple, a climbing worm along the petiole. Angiola inglese. A warm breeze lufts clothesline sheets. Cinnamon apple pie. Richard L. Matter. Apple blossoms, the flow lines of moss and bark. Janice Doppler. Cinnamon-scented candle, the sudden craving for apple pie. By Sally Chatterjee Dutt. Leftover apples, the life we have together, crumbles. Tracy Davidson. Summer shadows, the colour of ripe plum. J. Friedenberg Tropical sky in my glass A persimmon peel swirls Laughing waters Pomegranate Crackling of embers in the fireplace Daniela Miso Monsoon memory On palm and mango trees Thick dust. Krista Pandy. 
waxing moon on the branches, unripe mangoes. Joe Sebastian Out of season, I am still ordering mangoes online. Minal Sarosh Sneaking a peek through the screen door, the smell of raw mangoes. Zara Mugis And now our next nomination, this time by James Young. Morning, James. How are you? Morning. Fine, thank you. The sun has just started shining. Oh, jolly good. And have you been out for your morning swim yet? Not yet, no. I've been delayed by something. Have you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the cat's just zoomed in anyway. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of traditional. It's a shame we're not doing a video of this one because it's sort of traditional to have a cat on the podcast, even though I don't have one. As I said at the beginning, James is very active behind the scenes at Poetry P. Last season, he helped me with guest editing the submissions. And this season, he is, along with Robert Horobin, a regular editor for us. And Jim, I have to say, it's a real help to me. Thank you so much for doing it. No problem. James has a hobby that created some interest last time I spoke of it. He writes poetry on pebbles and leaves them dotted, dotted about, mostly, I think, on the beach near where you go for your daily swim. That's right. Many of us, or many of you, I should say, asked practical questions last time about how to do it. So, Jim, tell us, what type of pen do you use to write your poems on the pebble? Well, on the white pebbles, I use a Stapler um, fine point. And for the black pebbles, which are very nice, I use a, a similar pen, but it's a paint pen with a, a nib of the size that will, will fit a pebble. And um, you've got to shake it a bit, but once it's on there, it's kind of permanent. Until the sea, over time, decides differently. But they are taken home by people who put them on the sideboard. And I think that's really nice. I know. I was going to ask you... What details do you put on the on the pebble? Because you on get the, messages from people, don't you? Yes, on the reverse side of the space, I put um, my email address. I put my name, Jim Young, June 2021. And then I put my email address. And if the space, I put my Twitter handle. I think, it's a, I think it's a lovely idea. I've tried to do it myself, but I don't think the Swiss are really into my little messages. But I suppose I have the extra um, problem of I'm writing English poetry and my mm -hmm. local people are Swiss German speakers. So it's such a lovely idea. And so many people were interested last time that I thought I'd say, if you want to get in touch with James and talk pebbles, he can be found at Bait the Lines on Twitter. And of course, James, your books are available on Amazon too. They, I'll they put are. all those details in the show notes. Right. James, which poem have you chosen for your nomination and why? I've chosen this one by Marie Durley. Snow falling silently, the drunk man. And as soon as I read this haiku, I felt it to be the repository of many deep thoughts. The three simple lines say so little that the perspective of the distance from the full interpretation was as enormous as it was attractive. Is it the snow falling silently, or the man falling silently, or both? Or is he just walking unsteadily as the snow falls silently? I mean, it's obviously winter time, so the kigo is obvious, but one is not concerned with the season here, but rather with a feeling of sadness, possibly colder than winter itself, Perhaps it is Christmas and the and party time. We've all been there and walked home a little the worse for wear. And I, I cannot help but feel sorry for this drunken man. The life and soul of the party is now all alone. And the joy is falling slowly with the relentless snow and the sinking feeling as he too falls. I can almost see a lamppost and a blue shadow like a, in like a scene from a film. Uh, and after considering my thoughts on the scene depicted by Marie's haiku, I feel it might be classed as half a haiku and half a senri. I mean, there's, there's an underlying unease about snow that goes on and on, falling and falling silently. And the underlying sadness of a drunk falling and failing that leaves an ache in the reader's mind. 
The happy drunk of summertime is contrasted here by this drunk swaddled in snow and thoughts at the year's end. It is an iconic image recognisable by all, but no drunk or snowdrift could encapsulate the scene as this haiku from Marie does. In the same way that winter presages the year's end, this gentle heighten settles the mind for some profound reflection. It's left me with a longing to hold this moment by reading it over until the drunk is safe and sound and tucked up in bed and the snow has removed all traces of sadness before the rising of the sun. All that is in these three lines by Marie Durley. Snow falling silently, the drunk man. Thanks, James. I think mm. a bit like you, this poem really reached into my heart and, mm. and I wanted the drunk to reach the safety of home, but somehow I'm left with a, a real fear. Mm. And I think you, how did you put it? It wasn't anxiety, but there was, there was something sad about it. And I, I fear that he or she doesn't make it home. I didn't know if I was the snow, the drunk man or the observer. I don't know where I was in that. It was it moved around amongst all the three, the three little lines and all that came out of it as, as like the snow. It just kept coming out of it and settling. It was, it was a great example of the way haiku leaves the reader to get into the story and, and, and tell it themselves. That's right, James. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, James. So now let's hear some more fine examples of haiku and senryu. Hidden deep in fallen snow, more snow, Carol Judkins. Lingering snowfall, a whiff of green follows our footprints, Lorraine A. Padden. Winter morning, I kickstart the motorbike, Amrutha Prabhu. Heavy snow. Junkos in and out of the sword fern. Richard Tice. Sledding. Each long walk back. Ronald K. Craig. Wolf Moon. North Wind Howls. Pam Joy. Silence. Icicles encase the wind chimes. Valentina Rinaldi Adams. Dead of winter. Duvet deployment. Three layer night. Richard Bailey. Winter rain. Old buskers out of tune guitar. Sherry Grant. There's no point to icicles in springtime. Mark Farrar. Glimpsing infinity in the swallow's lazy eight, a cloud of insects. Robert Horobin. Fledgling's first leap, floating on a breeze, morning birdsong. Kim Russell. Sun-warmed shadows, the hue and cry of fledglings. Craig Kittner. Clumsy flight, quieter and quieter, in the blackbird's nest. Yeslov Karlinski. First light, the goldfinch hangs from a cherry blossom. Bruce H. Feingold. Spring weeding, the persistent chip-chip of a tohi. Sarah Paris. Cherry tree branch, two doves poise for the day. Richer Sharma. Roman ruins, each marble column crowned by a stork's nest. Michael Dudley. 
A swan's feather, all that remains of migratory birds. Isabella Kramer White feathers in a thawing bird bath. Fishbone cloud. Hifsa Ashraf Tundra, swans land in the blank field. Dorothy Mahoney Morning Ritual I Mimic Coal Mimics Me Vandana Parashar Cuckoo Call Copper Beach Turning from Pink to Purple Mike Gallagher At the Old Pond High Overhead The Sound of Cranes Paul Engel Paul, I found your choice of cranes an interesting one. Cranes, the birds, yes, I understand. But I can't help but visualise this piece as a comment on urbanisation. Cranes, in this instance, being the construction crane. Around here where I live, I start to see them at the beginning of spring. The ground begins to thaw, snow melts and construction begins. Spring, draining out my head. Alex Fife. Longer days lift my mood. Spring in my step. Karen Harvey. Leaves in the village pond. A frog creates ripples in the stillness. C.X. Turner. Tadpole in the clear water's edge, becoming a froglet. Christina Chin Winter's end, from the upturned wheelbarrow, a curling tabby tail. Ted Sherman Ponies, their first time on grass, bouncing, bouncing. James Young What I like about this one is the way James has repeated the word bouncing in the final line. It feels like an onomatopoeic word and of course I think it's a play on the idea of spring. Bouncing, spring. And in this case it reinforces the spring kigo. Ploughed fields, sweat trickles along the farmer's furrowed brow. Paul Callas Spring sunshine, mum chases her wandering son. Susan Plumridge Spring rain, the fly waiting under the hat of the garden dwarf. Maya Daneva. Maya, this really made me smile. I think most of us can connect with the idea of spring rain and finding shelter where we can. And in this poem, you give us a poem that could really be in next month's podcast on selective realism. You've really homed in on a small detail on your garden gnome. And it's really amusing, isn't it? A wrinkled face behind the narrow window. Fleeting spring. Natalia Kuznetsova. Maple ribbons swirl red, white and blue. Uniting kingdoms. Richard Downs Memorial Day An empty trampoline Pools rainwater Doris Lynch Memorial Park The mating call 
of a Shikada. Nina Singh Letting go and moving on, waning blossom moon. Angela Terry Hollow Willow, Stories Hidden in the Fog Ava Drobner Now let me take a little bit of time out just to say thank you. Last month, May, I had a lot to be grateful for. I received some wonderful books of haiku. Stanford M. Forrester sent me a selection of his haiku works, and I can really recommend them. I especially loved the special press book Staten Island, written about his everyday goings-on and life on the island. It felt really personal, and yet I could identify with so many of his poems. Debbie Strange sent me a copy of A New Resonance 12. I feel so lucky to have a wonderful book like this, with a dedication written by Debbie in her own fair hand. Thanks, Debbie. It's very special. Congratulations to you and many of our friends who are featured in this book. And last but not least, Maeve O'Sullivan sent me a copy of her new book, Wasp on the Prayer Flag. It's published by Alba. Some of her haiku brought tears to my eyes as they reminded me of my summer holidays in Ireland. I felt very homesick and a great longing to get back there. But as we all know, it's going to take time for that to happen. But in the meantime, I have your book to remind me, Maeve. Thank you very much. And next month, Maeve's coming along to give us a reading. I'm looking forward to that. Let's hope there are no tears. A big thank you to my coffee patrons, who in May helped me to pay for my SoundCloud subscription. Thank you to Linda L. Ludwig, Jason Furtak, Richard L. Matter, Eve Castle, Alison Douglas Turner, Pam Joy, Mariangela Kanzi, Marilyn Ashbaugh, and Neera Kashup. I'm so grateful to you for helping me to keep the podcast going. I know not everyone can afford a coffee, but if you can, there's a button on the website that allows you to donate. No pressure. Now, on with the poetry. Evening downpour, the linden tree fragrance, all alone. Samo Kreutz. Tiny butterflies, a garden chase full of children's laughter. B.A. France. Football practice on green grass under bright lights. Long nights ahead. Rob McKinnon. The cut of a coyote call, summer grasses. Marilyn Ashbell. Summer night sky, a star so close to the waning moon. Lakshmi Aya. Young love watching the sandcastle crumble. Eugenius Zakarski. Double rainbow. I give myself one more happy ending. Bona M. Santos. Summer night rain. She combs her long hair again and again. Milan Rajkumar. Golden sky, first kiss on the sand, thunderstorms. Ellen Orowitz. Snow cone river, a child licks her bluing wrist. E. L. Blizzard. Mojito, muddled and iced, young woman with a twist. Linda L. Ludwig Freckled faces, sand, salty air, days and days and days. Robert Kithada 
Strawberry kisses and cream mustachios taste the sun. E. L. Forrest Her absence, all the fireflies bottled up. Ravi Kiran Fireflies abound, one sits on my palm. Date night, Ekta Rana Grimy and sweaty, keen to wash off the summer and meet her. Pretty Kula Walking in the pines, the soul of my getter catches one needle. Joan C. Fingon Wind-blown seeds settle on Gran's grave. When will they bloom? David He Collecting seeds from wilted sunflowers, waiting a new life. Lisbeth Ho Ripe barley brushes the sunlight, autumn leaves. Robert Whitmer Bare trees through the dollhouse window, a dusty smile. David Oates His three-tooth grin, our fingers slimy with pumpkin seeds. Deborah P. Kologi I love the image in this one, the three-toothed grin, and the change in senses from the image of the toothless grin to the feel of those slimy pumpkin seeds. It's got a great rhythm, and the Kigo pumpkin seeds will definitely connect with many people, I think. Falling leaf. How we heal after an argument. Eve Castle. Harvest moon. Kettle of rice. Glows orange. Douglas J. Lanzo. Moon's a very useful tool in Kigo, very popular. And I was very surprised that we had so few moons in this Kigo prompt. But there'll be other opportunities, no worries. Fallen witness tree. The winds of October have no borders. Bill Fay. November night, a kite rides out the storm on a tree branch. Srinivas S. Monarch migration, the unexpected tremor of my lips. Debbie Strange. Monsoon showers, he learns to write in italics. Anjali Wahapande. First monsoon rain, this sudden urge to whistle in the dark. Kanchan Chatterjee It's our final poem and our final nomination this month. Mark, welcome back to the podcast. It's been a while. It's great, it's great to be back. It's good to have you. Now, Mark and I have in mind another podcast topic that I hope we'll get the chance to work on together later in the year, long haiku. I've started collecting a few examples that I'd like to feature, and I think you have too, haven't you, Mark? I, I found a few, but there, there are not many around. But if you, if you look, you can find one or two, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually had found one this morning in the submissions for this month, so um, fingers crossed it gets chosen and we can put that one in too. So, Mark... Which poem caught your attention as your nomination and why? Well, the one I chose was Fingers Swirling Through the Button Basket, Late Autumn Rain uh, by Mimi Ahern. 
Um, and what I like about this one is the way it works on various levels, all of which kind of fit together. So first, I think I get the sounds. Fingers swirling through the button basket is a lovely image. And I can just hear the shimmer of those plastic buttons as someone searches through them, looking for the right color and shape. Meanwhile, there is a different kind of shimmer, an echo of that sound, perhaps, at the window, caused by late autumn rain. So I think there is a, a, a kind of an inside, outside, or indoors, outdoors, or a, a human nature thing going on here, linked by the two similar sounds. But I also like the sounds and rhythms, perhaps the euphony in the words themselves. The first two lines have a trochaic meter, if I know how to pronounce that word, um, with the stress on the odd syllables. Now, it, you, know, you don't usually find this sort of thing in haiku, actually. So, fingers swirling through the button basket. It, it's quite a bouncy rhythm. And then we get a completely different rhythm and different vowel sounds, which really emphasize the break in the two parts of the haiku. Late autumn rain. And then I'm kind of intrigued and I go back again and think about the words and remember relatives of mine sewing and replacing buttons in the past. And for me, this is where the Kiga works really well. I realize this haiku mentions the season and it's not particularly clever as Kigo, late autumn rain. Of course, for me, autumn is very common, but not necessarily for the world outside of the UK. But it makes me think of someone perhaps on a gloomy Sunday afternoon, making a start on those jobs that need doing now that autumn has really settled in and the days are getting shorter and darker. So for me, it's very atmospheric and, and works really well. Thanks, Mark. I think you've hit the nail on the head with what you said here about Kigo. It's a tool we can use to evoke em emotion in our reader. Mimi has used it thoughtfully here. And if you go back and read through the other poems, you'll see that's a common thread. And I agree with you also about autumn. I think if you evoke autumn, it almost always evokes a gloomy or um, a sad thought into, in your head. Thanks, Mark, for closing out the podcast with your reflection on Mimi's poem. And now our three judges will debate which of these poems will be the judge's choice and which the honourable mentions. I just hope it doesn't get bloody. Thank you to my lovely judges for taking the time to read the submissions, make their choices and write their commentaries, which will be in the Summer Journal, scheduled for September. And that's it for this week. I've got a few little reminders and a request for you. If you do have a bit of time, could you go and test out the changes on the website? And if you have any more suggestions for how I can improve it and make it easier to use, just email them to me. Next time, I'm joined by Richard Tice for a place name workshop. His essay in the Spring Journal was very popular and so I invited him onto the podcast to tell us more. And as I said, Maeve O'Sullivan will be coming along to join me with a reading from her book, Wasp on the Prayer Flag. Don't forget, the next submission period runs from the 1st to the 20th of July. You can write any haiku you like using Yugen. Check out the website for the YouTube and podcast workshops from Stanford M. Forrester, which will help you. Thanks, as always, for your submissions and for coming along and joining me today. I'll see you soon, but until then, keep writing. Now, I really hope I've got everything right, but if I haven't or I've left something out, just let me know by email and I'll make sure to correct my mistakes. Ciao!